Hi, I am pretty sure that by now many of you will know that China has finally launched its 003 type carrier, which is now named Fuzhang. This is something that was expected and exactly because of this, in the past few months, we have given a very large coverage to the carrier and the possible air wing, at least as far as the information is in the public domain. So I think that you may be interested in this long format that pulls together all the videos that we have dedicated to this ship and to the emerging Chinese naval aviation. Enjoy! What is... I'm sorry, but this doesn't make sense at all. Sir, according to my research, this is the situation. What is the Chinese Navy has one ex-Soviet carrier, a copy of an ex-Soviet carrier, they are building a indigenous medium carrier and that's basically it. They also put on hold the building of the fourth carrier. This is at best an incomplete view, sir. What is this is the Chinese Navy, it's not the US Navy. They don't have the same power projection requirements. In fact they don't. Their purpose is different. Okay, so what's the purpose for you? Let me explain, sir. Hey, we have already covered the recent history of the efforts of the Chinese Navy to acquire aircraft carrier capabilities in the context of the description of the long shadow that has been cast by the Soviet naval aviation on many modern navies. The video covers a lot of details and if you're interested, you can find it here. For our purpose today, it's enough to recall that China operates two aircraft carriers. The first is actually the ex-Soviet ship Variag, purchased in shady circumstances in 1998. There was an adventurous towing to China, a long refit, and finally in 2016, the ship has been declared operational under the name of Liaoning. But that wasn't to remain an isolated case. In 2007, China purchased from Russia four sets of aircraft carrier landing arrest equipment. So this was a clear indication that something else was going to happen. And in fact, in 2013, the building of an entirely domestic carrier was started. The ship was actually a bigger and slightly more capable copy of the Liaoning, with a displacement of about 70,000 tons. The lessons learned with the Liaoning had been put in practice with the Shandong, this is the name of the second carrier, increasing the room available for the aircraft and also improving the deck operations. At the end of 2019, the carrier was declared combat ready. And after the Shandong, nobody expected the Chinese to stop there. And in fact, the Type 003 came along. In 2016 and 2017, reports about this new aircraft carrier started to appear in the specialized press. Soon it was clear that in Shanghai something big was being built by the Jiangnan Shipyard Group. In mind, this is not the same Dalian shipyard that built the previous two, so the Chinese have two shipyards with the capability of building aircraft carriers. We don't know much about the ship, but all the information that we have, which comes from the fragments of information that are actually published on the Chinese internet, rather than from the satellite pictures that we have, of the construction have been really dissected by the analysts, so we can have some rough estimates about the ship. The most recent estimates place the Type 003 at 318 meters length with a beam of 78 meters on the flight deck. The displacement has been estimated to be a little shy of 100,000 tons larger than the initial estimates. Overall, this means that the carrier is probably just slightly smaller than the Gerald Ford class. Some analysts actually believe that the ship was going to be some sort of an intermediate model, akin to what the Kitty Hawk had been many years ago in the United States fleet, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So the Chinese apparently skip a generation, and the fact that there is a large basing beam built in the south that is 
pretty much just big enough to host a Type 003 is probably telling us that this is going to be a sort of a standard measure for Chinese aircraft for the years to come. The Type 003 is still being built, but we can identify some differences with the Ford class. For example, the Type 003 doesn't feature a nuclear propulsion, but its propulsion system is not entirely conventional either. In fact, it seems that the ship is going to have an integrated electric propulsion. This means that turbines, boilers, or any other power generating element on board of the ship is not connected directly with the propellers, but is only used to produce electrical power, which is transferred to electrical engines driving the propellers. This type of propulsion is becoming increasingly popular because it has several advantages in terms of design, but also efficiency compared with older configurations. But this choice also makes sense because the Type 003 will be equipped with three electromagnetic catapults, each one of those 105 meters long. On a carrier flight deck, basically we just see a rail with a shuttle moving on it, but actually catapult is a relatively large system that, that may influence the whole ship design. For example, steam catapults require the boiler to generate the steams and all the piping required to bring the steam from the boiler uh, to the catapult that has a complex mechanical system that pushes the aircraft when is needed. On the contrary, electromagnetic catapults require a large amount of electric power being delivered very quickly to accelerate the aircraft. And this requires to bring the electrical power to accumulation devices and all uh, the cabling that is actually required, all the control systems. In the United States, the development of the emails has been long and bumpy, but the advantages of the solution compared with the steam catapults is quite clear. The Chinese don't have any direct experience, but even in this case they have decided to skip a generation and point directly to the most modern solution. Another element that heavily influences the design of the ship is the hangar. It seems that the hangar of the Type 003 is going to be slightly smaller than the Ford class hangar, and it will have only two large aircraft elevators rather than the three that are present on the Ford class. The ship is expected to be launched in 2022, to be delivered in 2024, and to reach the initial operational capability in 2025 or 2026. However, the Chinese don't have any experience in running a catobar carrier, so delays are definitely possible. And this consideration, rather than budgetary concerns, is probably the reason why the Chinese have decided to pull the project of the Type 004, a nuclear aircraft carrier, on hold for the moment. In fact, if we have to listen to official plan statements, the service is actually still evaluating aircraft carriers to see if they're useful or not. So, in theory, current carriers, including 003, are all experimental carriers, useful to train people, establish a doctrine, and establish a naval tradition about aircraft carriers. So, while it's obviously true that the Chinese Navy has to go through a learning curve, this entire approach doesn't seem to be realistic. And this is what Otis was saying at the beginning. And actually, he has an idea. Carriers allow sea control over critical trade routes, and they project air power over coastal areas up to a depth into the continental mass that includes the bulk of the population. They can deny the use of the sea to an opponent, and they can protect friendly or neutral sea traffic that is essential for the survival. And in fact, the United States uses the carriers to project power globally. This is basically what a maritime empire does, and the United States are a maritime empire, even though I'm well aware that this way of putting things is definitely not politically correct. But what is the imperial drive for China? Well, for China is the necessity of having access to energy and food. The most important maritime routes for China are those that lead to the Middle East for oil,
So from the point of view of China, it may seem reasonable to have a force of aircraft carrier capable of protecting those trade routes from the only opponent that in theory has the possibility and the capability to shut them off, the United States. However, look at the map. Well, it looks like China has a problem. Right here, the Malacca Strait. It is a choke point surrounded by countries whose allegiance may not necessarily be to the Chinese. Those countries may host American or Western coalition forces that build a barrier that make the Middle East and Africa completely inaccessible, even without aircraft carriers. If the United States could assure the loyalty of countries like Singapore, but also Malaysia or uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, there is no way for the, that the Chinese could open up that route. In that case, the only possibility for the Chinese would be a physical invasion of those land areas or a neutralization of all the infrastructures that would be used by a Western coalition in those areas. And now, what would you need to do such an operation? Well, obviously an invasion force, an amphibious force, But mostly, you need air superiority. And the only way to bring aircraft from China in the area against a hostile opposition? Yeah, it's a force of aircraft carriers. Okay, but now, don't forget that the American carriers will still be there. And with the carriers still available, what should you do before acquiring the control of the Straits? West for a long time has been sort of assumed that the long-term plan of the Chinese was to deploy six aircraft carrier, two in the north, two in the south and two in the east facing Taiwan, where the carrier were going to become the centerpiece of a defensive system that goes beyond the first island chain. However, some analysts have found older Chinese publications that actually hint to something different. In some Chinese publications, it is stated that they are well aware that no real confrontation with the United States may happen till the Chinese Navy is actually capable of fighting and winning against the US Navy in blue waters. And to do so, they assessed that at least a force of 10 aircraft carriers was needed. And mind, the Chinese always make long-term plans. So, what if, and it, this is a what if, this is a speculation, what if the Type 004 carriers and eventually the, a future 005 are going to be designed to attack and defeat the US Navy in blue water? What if they are not going to be defensive tools, but they're going to be offensive weapons? What kind of ship do you need? And in particular, what kind of carrier group and what kind of carrier wing do you need to execute this mission? Well, this will be the subject of the next video. Okay, let's talk Chinese carrier wings. So, in the last video we discussed what may be the long-term plan of the Chinese Navy from a strategic point of view. The aircraft carrier Type 003 is going to be launched soon, the Type 004 will follow and then surely there is a long-term plan on how to use them. The end state in 10 or 15 years is going to be a carrier fleet, but its main mission is probably still uncertain. It can either be the centerpiece of a defensive posture to defend the first and the second island chain, or it could be an offensive force to contrast the US Navy in blue waters and to support ground operations in the Malacca Strait. Or it could even evolve from a defensive force to an offensive force for what we know. Fact is, US Navy is the only opponent that could conceivably contrast a fleet of 6 to 10 Type 003 and 004 aircraft carriers trying to access the Indian Ocean. Sir. 
I suspect many Indian viewers will be upset by this observation. Come on, artists, let me have some fun from time to time. Anyway, the carrier is only a mobile infrastructure. What makes the carrier worth having is the carrier wing. In fact, the capabilities of the aircraft based on the carrier are basically the offensive capabilities of the carrier group. Some kind viewers in the previous video pointed out how the Chinese are intensely working on hypersonic and ballistic anti-ship weapons. And these may indeed be another piece of the puzzle. In fact, these weapons in the near future may become an important part of the capabilities provided by the carrier battle group. However, this is a subject for another time. In this video, we are focusing on the potential carrier wing of the Type 003 and 004. And since we like being different, where everybody else would start from the fighters, we start from the force multipliers. Oaxes, tankers, drones. Probably the most important force multipliers of all are the airborne early warning radars. And in September 2020, the KJ-600 made its maiden flight. The Chinese have invested heavily in the development of OAXs and they have several models in service. However, it is not easy to convert that kind of platform for naval use. In fact, albeit some have found some similarities with the larger Xi'an Y7, the KJ-600 is smaller and probably designed a dock. Its development though was unusually long for the Chinese. In fact, it was necessary to build a technology demonstrator. The JZY01 flew for the first time in, in 2001. It has been used during the years to test several different configurations and the current configuration has been seen for the first time in 2012. The KJ-600 has the same general configuration of the two Okai because, uh, well, it's, it's just concurrent engineering. There is nothing intrinsically special or secret in the E2 platform. As we speak in April 2022, the aircraft is still in development, so we don't have a wealth of news about it. The Radum seems to be an actually rotating Radum, which is different from the most recent Chinese configurations, but it seems unlikely that the radar is not going to be an AISA radar. Some sources are reporting that the KJ-600 is going to benefit of a very advanced solution in terms of battle management and network-centric warfare. It is suspected to have four or five operators stations that will benefit of the integration with an indigenous high-speed data link, the DTS-03. The data link will feature a bandwidth of 2 megabit per second, a range of 400 kilometers, and it will support, obviously, voice and data communications. Sir, have you ever wondered if military data links do support music streaming? Uh, please ignore him. We don't know if the DTS-03 supports music, but we know that the DTS-03 supports adopt networking. This means that the network can be formed spontaneously and can be composed by all the assets that support the data link within range without the necessity of having a node or several nodes to create the network. Probably in different contexts, it would be called a peer-to-peer -peer network. Some numbers about the radar range have been bouncing around in the press, but they are the usual meaningless numbers. What seems certain though is that the KJ-600 is going to be a definitely an improvement if compared with the current situation. In fact, on the current type 001 and 002, the Liaoning and the Shandong, the Chinese used Kamov 31 helicopters in the same role. And it is clear that the KJ-600, compared with the helicopters, will have more time on station, more operators, more computing power, more electrical power, and it will be faster. <laughs> All observers agree that the KJ-600 will require a catapult 
to take off from a carrier. So it surely won't be on board of 001 and 002, but it seems only logical that it will be deployed on 003 and following. We have no news of the introduction of a tanker aircraft on the Type 003 carrier. This may not be an anomaly since even the United States Navy doesn't have a dedicated tanker anymore and the F-18 uh, covers this uh, role too. But this is a missing capability, it is a compromise, it is not by design. In fact, this is going to change in the near future with the introduction of the MQ-25 in the United States, but there is no sign that the Chinese are going down this way as well. We can speculate that once you have a platform like the KJ-600, while removing all the electronics and all the OX equipment, you can possibly adapt that platform for the tanker role. But this is just speculation. China, since 2019, has introduced in service a stealth UCAV, the GJ-11 Sharp Sword, which probably a world first. It has a flying wing configuration, not too dissimilar from the MQ-25 or the Neuron, the Okotnik, and several other experimental projects. It is designed as a ground attack unit and it has two weapon bays that can house each kind of compact PGMs. We know that it is in service with the Air Force, but its actual use so far it is actually shrouded in secrecy. The wingspan is estimated to be 14 meters, the empty weight is 6,350 kilos, and the maximum takeoff weight is 20,200 kilos. It is subsonic, the engine has no afterburner, and the speed is estimated to be around 500 knots. The transfer range is declared to be about 4,000 km, which means that probably the combat uh, range is in the region of a bit more than 1,000 km. Not enormous, but pretty decent. Some analysts believe that the aircraft as it is now cannot operate from carriers, and granted it will need an adaptation. However, if the engine thrust is probably low for carrier operations, the wing seems capable of quite a lot of lift, and you can spot quite large flaps on the trailing edge. So while it is questionable that it could take off from a ski jump, I don't believe there will be any special issues in launching it from a catapult even at maximum takeoff weight. The maximum takeoff weight is a bit high, but that's what the sources are saying, so take it with a pinch of salt. In any case, there are official drawings that show a drone like the GJ-11 on the deck of a Type 003 or Type 004 carrier, or even on the deck of the conjectured Type 076 amphibious assault ship. All these three types of ships will be equipped with electromagnetic catapults, at least according to the plans. Operating a drone from a carrier is obviously more challenging than operating a drone from a land base. However, it is a technology that doesn't require a particular breakthrough, so it is probably within reach of everyone who wants to put the effort in it. And if this was the case, it may well happen that the Chinese are going to be the first to deploy a combat drone on board of a carrier. All these systems that we have just described do exist with the purpose of supporting the combat component of the carrier wing. And the combat component will be the subject of the next video. Hey, in the first video of this series, we have discussed the Chinese aircraft carrier type 003, which is probably going to be launched this year. In the second video of the series, we discussed the force multipliers that are likely going to be part of the carrier wing. In this video, we are going to discuss the combat component of the air wing. So be prepared for J-15, J-20 and something unexpected about the brand new J-35.
The Xinyang J-15 is the current centerpiece of Chinese naval aviation. The translation of the Chinese name means Flying Shark, while the NATO moniker is Flanker X-2. Yes, because the J-15 is actually one of the many flanker variants that populate non-Western aligned air forces around the world. I always stress that the Chinese do copy way less than is commonly believed, but in this case the J-15 is indeed a copy, a reverse engineering of a Suhoi 33 prototype that was sold by the Ukraine. The prototype was acquired in 2001, the project started in 2006 and the first flight happened quite quickly in 2009. Problem was, Russia was not okay with China copying the aircraft and something similar actually happened with the J-11. So there has been quite a long and harsh confrontation about intellectual property between Russia and China, but this is a story for another time. 2012, the aircraft landed for the first time on the Chinese aircraft carrier Liaoning. That was in the end of development, in fact in the same year the first dual-seater took the skies. It is not clear how many aircraft are in service at the moment, we are in 2022, even because there have been a few accidents. It should be around 60 aircraft considering that right now the third production batch is running. These aircraft currently form the carrier air wing of the two aircraft carriers in service, the Liaoning and the Shandong. However, even though the two carriers and their air wing is considered combat ready, the main mission of these two carriers is to train pilots and personnel. About the aircraft itself, well, it's a flanker. So it looks like a flanker, it flies like a flanker, it has the same structure, performance and aerodynamics of a flanker. However, it is a Chinese flanker. In fact, the avionics has been derived from the J-11 and it is largely national, albeit it has been inspired by some Russian solutions. The Chinese have declared that 90% of the components are in fact Chinese. And if you consider that the aircraft may fly with Russian engines, well, judge for yourself. There has been a long running querel among the Western analysts. Some believe that J-15 is superior performance wise to the Suhoi 33, but not as sophisticated as the Suhoi 35. Others simply believe that it is utter junk. Sir, this is not politically correct. Okay, some believe that the reverse engineering was not adequate and this led to issues regarding the flight controls and the aircraft structure. And indeed, if the original Suhoi 33 was already a relatively heavy carrier aircraft, the J-15 is even heavier. It is actually an aircraft that polarizes the judgment quite a lot, which means that we are not really sure about this aircraft, because if we were sure, pretty much the judgment uh, would have been rather uniform, no? The one thing that seems certain, though, is that the current carrier configuration is really penalizing for the aircraft. Since both carriers are ski jump carriers, the takeoff weight of the aircraft is really penalized and this is something the J-15 doesn't need because it is already quite heavy. So for example, if a full fuel load is embarked, the aircraft payload is limited to two medium missiles and two light missiles. Now this seems very bad, but this wasn't really penalizing for for the original mission that these carriers had. In fact, these carriers are a derivation of an old Soviet design in which the carrier was supposed just to do the local air defense of the naval group if the aircraft just had to scramble to intercept the enemy, while range probably wasn't a big concern. Obviously, for a navy that has blue water ambitions, this is a rather severe limitation. This limitation is expected to disappear when the carrier 003 is going to enter service. In fact, it is going to be a catobar aircraft carrier with catapults. Analysts expect that the carrier wing, at least initially, will still 
be composed of J15s. In fact, there are confirmed news that two prototypes with catapult bars and strengthened structures are flying right now. It is not clear if the third production batch will actually feature this variant, which is believed to be named J15T. We will have to wait and see, but the wait is almost over. The J20 is currently the crown jewel of the Chinese aircraft industry. We have already discussed the aircraft at length on the channel, so I won't get into too many details, but I suggest you to watch the video, link above and below. Obviously the J20 is a land-based aircraft, so what does it have to do with the 003 carriers? Well, simple, in 2019 the Chinese press reported that the Chinese Navy had chosen the J20 as the new carrier-based stealth aircraft. Shortly thereafter, other news appeared that Chengdu was working to a naval version shortened. In fact, navalizing a ground aircraft is no easy task. The first element to consider is the role of the aircraft on the carrier. In fact, analysts do agree that J20 is not a multi-role platform. Considering the characteristics that we know, it is expected that the two main missions of the J20 will be BVR air superiority and long-range penetrations for ground attack with precision guided weapons. The absence of a cannon and the lack of usable external pylons greatly reduce the versatility of the platform. This means that an air wing cannot be formed by J20 only. List at the beginning, a component of J15 will be required. A second consideration is about the structure and the design of the aircraft itself. In fact, a naval aircraft while taking off and landing is subject to loads that are different and in generally higher than a land-based aircraft. The front gear assembly is subject to inertial loads when taking off from the catapult. The gear and the tail hook are subject to violent impulsive loads when landing. And the points where the gear legs and the tail hook are actually connected with the aircraft structure should be capable of bearing these loads and not breaking, and this is the easy part, but should also be dimensioned in a way not to show metal or material fatigue in the long term. And this is a bit more difficult to design despite the fact that today you have all these kind of computer simulations and so on. The whole aircraft must not be too flexible, that is, the wings and everything that is hanging underneath should not slam into the deck in case of a rough landing, and when launching the aircraft should not arch on the catapult. All of this must happen while we consider that the estate on the flight deck and in the hangar is at premium, so at least the wings are better be folding. And finally the marine environment is salty, hence it is very corrosive, so an adequate anti-corrosion treatment must be implemented. All this means that a carrier-based aircraft is at least a 5% heavier of an equivalent land-based aircraft. So Chengdu is modifying the aircraft in order to make it suitable for carrier use and is going to make it shorter so is going to occupy less space. So far, despite the fact that the development of the J20 is usually quite quick, we have seen no prototypes flying. And one element that I suspect is making this job quite difficult is the aircraft configuration itself. For a carrier aircraft, it is desirable to have a relatively low landing speed in order to reduce the amount of energy that needs to be dissipated by the arresting gear and reduce the landing loads. This is the reason why carrier aircraft tend to have wings larger and wing loads lower than equivalent land-based aircraft. The J20 configuration has quite small wings and probably relies quite heavily on the body to generate lift. 
it isn't clear, at least it's not clear for me, if such a configuration is conducive of being adapted for carrier use. Even considering that the small wing size doesn't leave too much room for high lift devices in terms of sophisticated flaps or slats. So I wouldn't be surprised if the aircraft was undergoing a partial wing redesign just for this reason. But this is speculation, so we'll see what happens. What is not speculation though is that now we are sure that the J-20 is not the only stealth aircraft that is going to operate from the Chinese carriers. A few weeks ago, an official tweet from a Chinese government account referred to an aircraft, a naval aircraft, as the J-35. This means that what has been known in the past, like the FC-31 or the J-31, has now finally received an official J number, which probably means that it is going to enter service with the Chinese Navy. The aircraft originates from the losing design of the competitions that gave birth to the J-20. Shenyang, rather than abandoning the project, kept developing the aircraft autonomously. There is a long story behind this aircraft and we are going to dedicate a specific video to the J-35. However, there are some points that in the context of the composition of the carrier wing should be addressed now in this video. And to immediately address the elephant in the... <laughs> Uh, sorry, I forgot every time you mention this expression is arrived, so... So the thing in the room is the striking resemblance of the aircraft with the F-35. The common opinion is that the aircraft was designed on the basis of stolen F-35 designs. And while it is true that the theft happened, there is actually a judiciary sentence that clarifies that it is possible, though, that this is a misconception. In fact, in 2020, Yang Wei, who was the chief designer of the, of the J-20, published an article in a Chinese professional Iros magazine. In that article, he explained how the J-20 was designed having the F-22 and, in general, the American design philosophy as the reference point. But in the same article, he also states that the Shenyang competitors did not get inspiration from the American designs, but they got inspiration from older Russian designs. And the aircraft he's talking about is actually the predecessor of the J-35. I couldn't access the original article because it seems that now that scientific magazine is behind the Chinese Great Firewall, however, I could find references of the article in Chinese press uh, pretty much in the same terms, so it may be possible that the article exists. You should have told me before, sir. While I was in China I could have acquired a copy. No comment. And by the way, if you want to have access to the sources that have been used for this video, they will be published on Patreon and for uh, the channel members. So if you like what you are seeing and you want to actually support the channel, you will have access to this extra perk. However, we are not done. There is more. Vladimir Barkovsky, an executive of MIG Bureau, discussing the aircraft in 2012, Despite the fact that the aircraft was featuring some solutions that have been already tested in some Western design, it was in fact an indigenous design. How did he know? Well, the MIG Bureau at the time was consulting for Shenyang, officially for the integration of the engines, but you never know. Even though there are strong similarities, there is a good possibility that the aircraft is in fact not a copy of the F-35. However, if you want to leave a comment that all of this is nonsense, that the aircraft is definitely a copy of the F-35 and the Chinese, after all, are only capable of cheap rip-off, please feel free. The comment section is open to everyone, even those who don't listen to the video. As I said, we will be covering the aircraft in the near future when probably a bit more information will be available, but still we have to consider which role is going to have in the carrier wing. Well, the role that is expected to cover on the 003 and 004 carrier wing is that of the multi-role light fighter. In fact, the aircraft is relatively small. It is much lighter than the J-15. It has about 
8 tons of payload with two internal bays that can host compact precision guided weapons. Plus, the aircraft can have up to six external pylons for uh, all kinds of payload. And it also seems that the radar will be one of our old acquaintances, but you will have to wait a dedicated video for that. However, while you wait for the J-35 video, there are plenty of other videos dedicated to the Chinese Air Force, the Chinese Navy and the China in general, and they are going to appear beside me. An enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon or by being a member, I bring you all in my heart. And for now, thank you very much for watching and see you there.